Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this first Be Flood Ready uh, webinar on people and property flood resilience. I'm Paul Schaffer, and just going to run through some simple housekeeping uh, slides. So, as you would have noticed, hopefully, uh, we are recording this, this session, uh, and the recording of the event will be placed on our YouTube channel once we have the necessary permissions from all, all the speakers. If you have any technical challenges or need any help with that, please use the chat fe uh, feature on, on Zoom and my colleague Barbara will help with that process. And uh, we also will be taking questions at the end of the two main uh, sets of presentations. So if you do have any questions, please do use the Q&A function in Zoom. And also, uh, please also uh, use that to vote for any questions you think are particularly useful. So I, I, I'm, uh, I would just want to take the opportunity to thank our speakers uh, today and then also pass you over to Fela Gonyoye, who is the chair of this session. So Fela, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Fola, Fola Gunyoye, uh, chair of the Project Steering Group for Be Flood Ready, SIWEM's Community of Practice for Property Flood Resilience. Uh, for those who are new to PFR, which is Property Flood Resilience, it's one of the now getting established approaches uh, to reduce flood damage and uh, disruption to the uh, uh, caused by flooding to, to people. So this community, uh, uh, which is badged under the Be Flood Ready banner, provides a national platform for those delivering and interested in PFR. Paul will provide a bit more information about it later. But it ties, what we're doing here ties nicely with Siren's vision to create a world in which professionalism and excellence uh, build connection to inspire widespread impactful water and environmental solutions. So this event and all the activities of Siren's Be Flood Ready initiative will not be possible without, uh, you know, the supporters and partners which you can see on your screen. So we owe them a debt of gratitude. Thank you very much uh, for making us do this. Now, PFR is unique in terms of what it is. Uh, normally, uh, for someone like myself who's been involved in so many flood alleviation schemes, you go out there, you build some big defense and, and all sorts of things. But with PFR, you're actually, you know, intervening in people's homes. So it's not just a property or a house, it's a home or their livelihood or place of business. And generally, the PFR role is not the primary role. While you, 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 in normal times, uh, it's being used for something else. So, so it's, it's quite a different thing. It means one needs to work very strongly with the people who will be using it, making sure that it works with them. Uh, and so it offers completely different challenges. Now, after we're going to have two presentations to start with. And after these two presentations, we'll have a panel Q&A session. And then, uh, uh, you know, we'll have a, uh, a presentation of, of a virtual fireside discussion, which will be also uh, uh, followed by Q&A session with all the speakers. Uh, following that, uh, as hopefully you're now seeing on the agenda, we uh, will then, uh, uh, that will be followed by uh, uh, a presentation of the SIWEMS B Flood Ready Community of Practice. My job is to get you finished by five o'clock. And to do that, I uh, definitely rely on yourselves uh, uh, today, so helping with that. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, welcome our first speaker, Mary Longdonow. Mary for, uh, is from floodmary.com. She is our first presenter. She Basically, she'll talk to you about people and PFR, so covering the benefits and processes of installing PFR for people. Now, Mary needs no introduction. Uh, she's a well-known face of flood resilience and PFR, herself having been flooded on many occasions. 
Uh, she runs her own consultancy, floodmary.com, that specializes in PFR. She's the author of a number of books, including the uh, ebook Property Flood Resilience, Stories from Homes and Businesses that have had adaptations to, to, to recover more quickly. And uh, she's also the co-author of the Household Guide to PFR and Household Guide to uh, Property Re uh, Flood Recovery. So just to remind you again, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function. And also please vote for all the questions that you're in interested in hearing a re response to. Over to you, Mary. Thank you, Fola. And thank you very much to SIWEM for inviting me to speak today. This winter has been absolutely brutal, hasn't it? And I have been fortunate enough to travel into communities that have been so badly impacted right into the heart of the communities with my floodmobile. Now, if people don't know what the floodmobile is, please go onto my website and find out more. But essentially, it's a house on wheels packed full of PFR. Um, so both to keep the water out and to um, help the house recover or properties recover after a flood. Now, as I've said, this winter has been so brutal and it's going to get worse with climate change. And I don't think I've ever had a more humbling experience than I have this winter, talking to those newly flooded, those people who have lost everything. Just one example, um, I, I was on the floodmobile holding the hand of a man in his late 80s. He told me that he wasn't in when his bungalow was flooded and he and his wife had lost absolutely everything. He said that it would be easy to clear him up when he and his wife die because all their memories were washed away. Every possession they had washed away. Can you imagine how they both feel? He also told me he didn't want to go back home. And I've heard that repeated many, many times. So there never has been uh, a bigger need for property flood resilience. We'll call it PFR from now on. But one thing I have to tell you all that everybody thinks PFR, they think products. They think flood doors, flood barriers, self-closing air bricks, et cetera. But property flood resilience is far more than that, far more than that. It's knowing your flood risk, signing up to flood warnings, having a plan. And a plan is absolutely essential because speaking from experience, when you get that flood warning, your mind will turn to spaghetti. And if you've got a plan written down, you can go through it step by step. Now, first of all, and then after preparing, then it's fitting your barriers or making sure that everything's there for you. And then, and very importantly in my book, it's having recoverable measures in place to allow you to recover after a flood. Everybody, right up until last week, um, that I have spoken to has nowhere ne nearing going back home, nowhere near it. So the case studies that I'm going to share with you are um, people that have built that better uh, and have been able to go home or go back to their businesses very quickly. So my first slide actually is just showing you that um, flood resilience doesn't have to be expensive putting your furniture up on trestle, trestle tables. That guy with the homemade flood barrier kept out many floods until the deeper one came. And even gaffer tape, if you put it up at the doors and across the top, that will give you time to move your stuff. So do remember that. I've tested uh, gaffer tape quite successfully. So can I have the next slide, please, Paul? So, those of you that have seen me present before will have seen Karen and I make no apologies for putting her up again because Karen, Karen epitomizes what I say. She's uh, got a flood plan. She knows a flood risk. She signed up to flood warnings and she and she has built back better. So if you can see that uh, she was flooded uh, in Storm Desmond and it reached unprecedented levels, it was 1.5 metres deep in her house. Next slide, please, Paul. 
And what she's done uh, is she made quite a few sort of minor modifications, really. She's got the steel modular steel barrier that we all know so well and love. And she replaced her wooden floors and carpet with concrete floors and tiles and tanked the walls. And the electrics downstairs were replaced higher up the walls and this flood plan. Next slide, please, Paul. And when she was flooded again, I'm sorry, I seem to have lost the slide. When she was flooded again, instead of 1.5 meters of water, she had five centimeters of water. She was able to pump it out, sanitize it and go back home within 24 hours. And um, she also didn't have a 48,000 pounds insurance bill. She had no insurance bill. So this is Lynn in Worcester. And you can see how deep the, the, the River Severn gets in Worcester. And it's flooded properties three times this year. And Lynn um, decided that she couldn't keep the water out. So she built in um, flood recoverability and she has been flooded on many occasions. Next slide, please. So her, she, instead of keeping the water out, she's listed her floors and rebuilt on block and beam to aid faster drying. She's uh, got underfloor heating, closed cell insulation, which can uh, recover from a flood, and uh, marble floored tiles. And she also has a plan and she needs to know exact flood levels. So important, not sort of pre-recorded levels, but exact levels. And uh, she's even inset her, her tile skirting boards into the plaster to stop moisture going up. And she's got limelight plaster to the wall. Instead of metal beadings to the edges of the wall, she put plastic beading in. And you can see her here, all ready to flood and flooded. Next slide, please. And you can see here, uh, she's got her white goods stacked up. She's got um, stone floors. And you can see that her kitchen is sort of essentially a floating kitchen and doesn't come right down. Uh, to the floor. Next slide, please. Now, everybody will have heard of Nick and Annie um, in because um, my slides will tell you more, but they are one of my case studies. And I'd like to tell you what they've done. They bought, uh, they bought this house for a song, really, because of its flood risk. And th the previous owner had put in some PFR and they uh, added to it. So the next slide, please. So the house was tanked and a cavity ward mem membrane system installed, submersible pumps that were all joined up. So if one packed up, the other ones kicked in, stone floors throughout, plug sockets raised up. You can see everything on the slide. Next slide, please. And you can see they'd even put their air source heat pumps up out of the way and secondary barriers in place because their porch wall was only one skin thick. And they use absorbent cushions to soak up any small amounts of water. And they, they've even lifted their beehives onto breeze blocks clear of the water. And the next slide, please. And we all saw this. I think the Environment Agents, uh, um, the BBC had um, 30 million uh, views of this. Um, he's now called the famous and successful King Canute of Worcester because a lot of his house isn't on foundations. He was very worried that the regular floods of, of what, uh, that were happening along the River Severn were going to actually cause structural pro um, problems. So he built a wall uh, around his house. And you can see how, uh, with the sw swans swimming, how the barriers were working very effectively. The next slide, please. Um, and you can see here a close up of the barriers uh, working properly. And um, he has, since he built the wall, he didn't even have time to finish it properly because there's no facing bricks on it yet. He's had three floods this year and three times that that system has worked. Um, they called it two and a half, so Arthur flood because it wasn't so deep. So they named the third flood Arthur. Next, state, next slide, please. Um, this is the waters, uh, Water Edge Inn in uh, Cumbria, and um, it was, um, it's 
very badly flooded on two occasions. And interestingly, they didn't think they'd flood again after the 2009 floods because they'd been told it was a one in 100 year flood. So they thought they were safe for 100 years. So yet again, we've got to find a new way of talking about risk. The next slide, please. So what they've done is the bar is now brick and it's been treated with a waterproof um, spray. They've got um, fixed seating that can be removed and the windows have been raised, as you can see, by a couple of feet. And they use their lower bar as a sump and they have a petrol generator and flood barriers are fixed to all the doors and sealed slate flooring throughout. The next slide, please. Um, and one thing that, that, that struck me when I went to interview uh, Water Edge staff for this is that they all have a plan. And when they take on new staff, one of the first things the new staff are trained in is their emergency plan to plan to flood. And they, their kitchen is designed to flood so the motor can be removed from the stainless steel cooking area. They've got vital kitchen equipment is raised above the floor level, as you can see, and all the stock behind the bar is in trays and can be easily removed. Next slide, please. And this is the lovely Sue uh, in Mythenroyd. Uh, she even taught me how to say that. I have to stick my thumb up, Mythenroyd. Um, and she's a lovely feisty woman and she has been flooded to six foot in her, in her hairdressers. And she did have flood barriers, but they were obviously over top, but they kept the flood water in there. And she found that her the windows were burst through, um, through from the inside rather than the out because of the sheer volume of water in there. And she did, um, just so you know, other properties, Sue had done this on a budget, everything on a budget because she didn't have flood insurance. Other properties uh, down the road in Hebden Bridge do have metal braces to their window so the flood waters can't burst through. Next slide, please. And you can see from the pictures that she's got stone flag floor, floors and the walls have plastic membranes and she's got external paint that's normally used externally, internally, non-return valves, a plastic kitchen, and all her fixtures and fittings are higher up the wall. Um, and she's got, um, everything is sort of upcycled or can be easily disposed of. For instance, plastic kitchen, uh, plastic mirrors, and the waiting chairs are metal. And her reception desk is something upcycled that can be thrown away. The next slide, please. And you can see here that sacrificial, up, um, um, upcycled furniture and she's got plastic doors to the architraves now plastic comes in all its cheapest chips can come in all sorts of colors I've even seen it pink and it can be washed down successfully and reused and the electric meter and fuse box as you can see is sited high up the wall now when Sue was flooded again she um, was able to instead of being shut for six to eight months as the first time she was able to wash down sanitize get the um, fires and humidifiers going and she was opened within only five days which she thought was absolutely wonderful and she said she did that on the cheap now there's lots more inspirational case studies in my emag which can be found on my website floodmary.com um, and, uh, you know, I, I really commend this this book to you because it will every house is different and each individual person has treated their house differently. For instance, another case study on the picture that you can see on the front actually success, successfully kept the River Seven out of his house to only puddles. So in the same view of row of houses, people adapted them to their own needs and wants. Next slide, please. And that's me done. And thank you very much for listening. And just before I finish, those poor dogs, they may look beautiful, but their home was flooded too. And they had to go on a boat to actually find somewhere to go to the toilet. So even animals suffer as well. So thank you for listening. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mary. You, uh...
Oh, oh, I mean the, 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 those lovely dogs. I mean, it, it, it's just it's just a way to finish. Uh, if anyone thought that property flood resilience is just about stopping water getting into the property, I'm sure you now know there's a lot of stuff you can do to the properties that even if water comes in, you can get out very quickly. So thanks for that, Mary. And I do vouch for uh, uh, some of those Mary's publications. It's something about actually you know something that tells it shows you how it's been done not just telling you to do it so a lot of those case studies are, are fantastic so uh please keep putting your uh please keep putting your comments on the q a and keep having a look at the ones there and voting for the ones you want we'll deal with them together after the next presentation so now i'll move on to the next presentation which will be a joint one uh from Juliet uh, DeLittle uh, and Richard Taylor, both from the Environment Agency. The presentation on the per uh, perception of PFR and how it influences take up and use will discuss some of the relevant Environment Agency research on PFR and explain how it's been applied. Now, Julia is a senior scientist in uh, flood and coastal risk management R&D uh, team. She works primarily on projects relating to uh, the flood and coastal risk management strategy and investment, and has a background in urban studies and civil engineering. Richard is a senior flood risk advisor at the Environment Agency. He leads their work to mainstream property flood resilience, in particular seeking to address some of the policy, financial, and behavioral blockers to greater take up. So uh, over to you, uh, Julia and Richard. Brilliant. Thanks, Fola. Um, good afternoon, all. Uh, thanks to Simon for hosting this webinar. It's, it's really great to be part of it. Um, people and PFR is a topic that's very important to us at the EA, as reflected by the crucial role it plays in our national flood and coastal erosion risk management strategy. Uh, so just in terms of the structure of our presentation, so I'll give a quick introduction um, into the EA's role in PFR and also why understanding people is so important to us. Uh, Juliet will then take you through uh, understanding behavioural science and the research projects we've undertaken and what the findings are. And then I'll finish off with how we're using the findings of that research in some of our practical activities. So next slide, please. So just in terms of uh, a quick overview of the EA's role. So we've got three main roles, um, delivering PFR schemes, supporting others to deliver, and also having um, that strategic overview in trying to make PFR a more mainstream way of reducing flood damage. So in terms of delivery, we have a flooding coastal risk investment program. Um, in the last six year investment program between 2015 and 2021, there were around 80 PFR schemes um, that were completed, better protecting around 1700 homes. Um, in the current program, there's almost uh, 100 PFR schemes um, and they are forecast to better protect over two and a half thousand properties. But new projects are being identified all the time and included in the annual refresh that we undertake um, uh, of our program. About 40 percent um, of the, the projects on the current program, so the PFR projects, are scheduled to be delivered by the Environment Agency with 60 percent by other risk management authorities and just over half are seeking to address um, the risk from river flooding. Uh, the majority of the rest are seeking to deal with um, risk from surface water. In terms of our supporting role, um, so we have a, a supplier framework. So in December, we launched a new PFR supply framework. Um, which can run for up to four years. Um, and that can be used both by ourselves and also other risk management authorities for the delivery of PFR schemes. We also support communities across England with preparations for flooding, um, including advice on PFR as well as recovery after flooding happens. And then in terms of our, our strategy role, so um, our FCRM strategy and associated roadmap contain uh, an ambition to mainstream PFR. 
Uh, and that's to ensure that people become more resilient to flooding um, and that damages are reduced and that people can ultimately get back to normal and get back into their properties quicker. Um, and there are several actions to address some of the blockers to achieving that ambition and, and they're being taken forward um, over the next few years. And those include elements involving things like insurance, um, skills, communication and engagement with communities. And so why is it important? That, that we understand people well PFR schemes are are very very different to traditional flood risk schemes they're not remote um you know somewhere in the distance benefiting a whole community that they're, they're individual to a home and to the homeowner that lives in that home they involve disruptions to someone's life and changes to their property so it's a very very different to um to a traditional maybe a flood bank or or a wall um, and you'll hear more about those differences um, from paul ricky henry and becca a little bit later so the criticality of engagement with individual homeowners can't be underestimated each individual is different They'll take on information in, in very different ways. Some will be able to make quick decisions. Some will take a little bit more time to make decisions. So it's really important to understand that people need to be taken on a journey to fully comprehend the nature of what's involved and why. And Juliet will talk more about the theory of sort of behavioral change and that journey that somebody needs to go on um, in a moment. And although we can only fund resistance products through our uh, our capital investments, it's important for home and business owners to recognise that PFR isn't just a fit and forget solution. Preparation, as Mary said, is critical. There are very, very important actions that need to be carried out. So whether it's um, signing up for warnings, whether it's um, having a flood plan, just that preparation element is, is massively important. And once the PFR is fitted, you need to look after it by checking it and maintaining it regularly. You need to take further actions yourself by looking at some of those recoverability measures within your property to reduce the damage. So we need to understand um, the best way to get those messages across to people and, and understand how people might react to those and, and how we might go about influencing them. And, and just to, to give a bit of um, sort of a practical um, element to it. So when I was working with local communities in East Anglia who were affected by flooding, there was an anecdote that it took three floods for people to take action to make their property more resilient. So after the first flood, you know, that's quite unfortunate to happen. After the second one, you know, they've been really, really unlucky. After the third, OK, there's probably a pattern here, so maybe I ought to do something. Now, we don't want people to wait three floods um, before they prepare their property. We want people to, to start acting now. And this is where the behavioural insights element comes in. So by better understanding what we can do to influence the decisions of home and business owners gives us the best chance of encouraging people to, to take some action. And with that, I'll hand over to Juliet to talk a bit more about behaviour science and the research that we've carried out. That's great. Thanks, Richard, um, for providing that context. And uh, as Fola mentioned, I'm from the research team at the EA. So we provide research based on the needs across FCRM, which are kind of determined by various academic and practitioner stakeholders. So that's where the research projects that I'll be talking about today have come from. Um, and I also just want to start by talking a bit about behavioural insights because the framing of a pro project can lead to kind of the types of conclusions that it can draw. And I think this is really important to think about, especially in terms of what other perspectives and insights could add. Um, also, behavioral science is very commonly kind of contested nebulous definition. So I just want to make sure that it's um, kind of that I explain how we've understood it here, because I know that it kind of means lots of different things in different spaces. Um, so really broadly, as it says here, behavioural insights or science, um, sometimes used interchangeably, can be considered a specific kind of application under the umbrella of social science, um, which provides insight into individual ac actions. Um, and this may sometimes try and include the wider social processes that I think these will become clear as I kind of work through the projects. But the focus is really ultimately sort of on, in this case, for example, the resident. Um, and their flood resilience. So in the table, you can see a bit of a distinction between social science and behavioral science. Social science thinking about really broad social phenomena or patterns across kind of big, bigger concepts like unemployment, but also flood risk management. Whereas behavioral science tends to focus on the individual, whether that's a member of the public, a resident, a customer, an employee, 
and their behavior and how that behavior can be influenced or like maybe what would lead to it. Um, so the projects, thank you, that I'm gonna discuss now, they both come from the behavioral science perspective. And I think that's really useful to understand them through. And um, I'll come back to some concluding thoughts towards the end about what um, impact I think that has. But there are two projects I wanna to touch on today. So on the left, you can see the first project. Um, this was com commissioned specifically to understand PFR, thinking about behavioral insights. And then the second project I'm gonna to speak to on the right-hand side, um, this came out of the first project from some of the recommendations and has much more specific interventions um, that were explored. They're both available online. Um, so feel free to take a look at them and I'm happy to chat about them if anyone's got any questions. Um, but if we go to the next slide, I'm gonna go into a bit more detail about this first report. So this project summarized behavioral sciences research that exist, that already existed around flooding. Um, looking specifically at property flood resilience measures um, that can reduce the damage, which as, as has been covered already is wide ranging kind of um, set of actions. So, the reason this um, research was undertaken was because despite the benefits of the measures that we know and the grants that can be available to install them, uptake still was recognized at low when this was done. It was published in 2021, so it's a couple of years old now. Um, and it kind of identifies thinking about the need to think about, think beyond practical challenges. So not only the uptake, but also, yeah, um, why, what may or may not lead someone to feel able or engaged with PFR. Having said that, it doesn't consider things like the standards of construction, accessibility, operation, long-term maintenance. These kinds of issues are beyond the remit of a behavioral science perspective. Um, but this work came up with this uh, six step theory of change that you can see on the screen here. Um, and it kind of starts with, uh, as Richard said, knowing that flooding might impact me and knowing, I guess, um, from the anecdote that it could happen again. So I think this is presented as a kind of linear six step process, but in reality, the arrows I think are trying to suggest that, you know, you can kind of go around in circles of various aspects of these steps um, before you necessarily, it's not kind of, it doesn't get set out as neatly as it suggests it might. Um, and it identified these six key moments. And the first three are kind of coded as a mindset or a belief, an attitude. And the second three are kind of target behaviors that result from these understandings and mindsets. So as I said, the first one is looking at kind of the awareness of flooding, whether it's happened, um, regardless of someone's been affected or not, the idea of the one in a hundred year event and residents feeling that then it's not a risk because it's no one who's going to be around in a hundred years time um, demonstrated in Hull that, that that kind of, even if you've been flooded, you may not know be so aware that it will happen again. Um, but that also you feel able and able to take action and responsible to take action. Um, and that you know kind of how to access these thoughts, these different options that might work in different contexts. Um, those are the kind of three key mindsets that are important, to, it found they're important to have to lead to adopting resilience, maintaining the resilience, which obviously is really important for it working properly, but and kind of deploying it or using it. Um, and I think it's also important to recognize that in behavioral insights, people or residents can become conceptualized as like one person in our minds. And actually there's a range of different individuals and residents and a range of different types of property with a range of different types of flooding that, that they're at risk from. And this diagram wasn't kind of developed intending to reflect precisely the decision-making journey for all individuals. Um, but it kind of is trying to bring together a framework from which the key issues can be highlighted and sort of worked through. Um, and while I think it usefully summarizes a lot of steps around what might lead someone to be um, able to install PFR, there are also some omissions. So I think the kind of circularity of these stages, as I mentioned earlier, is um, likely to kind of trip up parts of this or they might happen in different orders. So have being sticking to two kind of specifically might lead to um, up, I guess like unforeseen challenges, like it's okay to kind of shuffle it up, I think, and skip stages. Um, I think it also focuses 
kind of the reading this report focuses on um who's receiving the information rather than who, who is educating or communicating and i think there's an important awareness of who we are as rma actors or whoever we are about how we are portrayed publicly and 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 how we may be received um and i think it could be really constructive to consider what can be learnt both in both directions about that um and I think also it doesn't take into account necessarily challenges around grant cycles, availability of people to do the work or maintain the work, um, and also kind of residents and landlords. Um, so that's a summary of the first project. And I'm just going to move on to the next slide, if that's OK, to talk about this second project. So this project looked at um, behavioural insights and flood resilience more broadly, um, and it came out of the report that I just mentioned, because as you may have noticed, the six step model, the theory of change that was outlined there, while it was developed specifically for PFR, um, it, it kind of was identified as being really transferable ac across flood resilience and also highlights, I suppose, the um, importance of understanding the context of flood risk management while discussing or engaging with um, processes of flood um, property flood resilience. So it took the recommendations out of the previous project and using the theory of change to focus around three interventions. Um, the first one was looking at how to improve the website, um, how to plan ahead for flooding. The second was to increase click through traffic to key web content from social media. And the final one was to improve engagement with and usefulness of flood plans, um, which I think Mary mentioned earlier is a really integral part of PFR as well. So I've just copied a couple of the um, adverts here to illustrate the types of approach, but it was taking the kind of theory and literature from the previous report and applying really specific interventions to understand the impact of language and wording um, when trying to kind of engage with um, people that are using the flood service. So the first one on the left, I hope you can read it, says, would you know what to do in a flood? On a rainy day like today, it's a good time to find out. And this was framed as a curiosity framing. So I think it was trying to suggest, um, maybe you don't know this, come and, like, come and find out what uh, you might learn. And they were comparing that with this re reciprocity message on the right-hand side, which says, we're focusing on protecting Plymouth from flooding this winter, but we need you to do your bit too. Um, and it found that the reciprocity messages performance was considerably higher than the curiosity framing. Um, the kind of thinking behind this was that, that conveying a shared responsibility garnered higher engagement um, in this kind of sense of feeling like we're all in it together. And I think kind of key outcomes of this project is that it led to tangible practical fr changes in the messaging um, around the website and in the adverts. So it was kind of taking the theory from the previous project and applying it to come up with kind of tangible interve interventions. Um, so if I just go to the final slide from me, please, which is the next one. Um, kind of reflecting on these two projects as a pair, I think they're, they kind of provide a powerful insight into thinking about PFR, especially from a behavioral insights perspective, because there's the sort of theoretical um, six step process, which I think can, be a really powerful tool to apply broadly to different PFR measures or, or flood, flood governance in general. But the second one demonstrates how this can be done. So it was these three specific interventions and looking at a range of um, different responses to them. And I think considering them next to each other kind of highlights how it's hard to untangle PFR from flood risk management in general. Um, and that considering and approaching PFR can be more powerful um, when considered in sort of its broader context. Um, and I think while yeah, the framing of this research is really important, and I think there's there's a role that all of us can do, I think Mary's presentation did it really powerfully, but to be able to reflect on like what we might do in that situation, to be able to connect with why other people might make certain decisions and how, you know, there are lots of different um, contexts from different individuals and kind of housing situations renters and landlords, that's a kind of dynamic that's really potentially quite complex. Um, so thinking through these interventions, but with a kind of appreciation for the broader context will really can really help us to kind of capture interventions that might be more efficient than otherwise. So I'm going to pass back to Richard now, who's applying these findings um, in his team. Brilliant. 
Thanks for that, Julia. And that, that really uh, helps to frame kind of the work that we're doing moving forward um, and hopefully gives everyone on the call um, a bit of an idea around how you might be able to frame some of your work um, to, to really um, hone in on that behavioral science element. So um, at a similar time to the um, to the behavioral insights research being carried out, there were three areas in England that were funded to undertake practical research um, with communities on adopting PFR measures. And these were called P the PFR Pathfinder projects and ran between 2019 and 2022. And they used different methods, including things like the Floodmobile that Mary talked about earlier on, um, websites, a model flood house, face-to-face -face awareness raising sessions when um, they could do with COVID restrictions around at the time, um, case studies, et cetera. So we're using the theory of change model that Juliet explained in combination with some real life um, uh, practical research that we've done um, uh, from the Pathfinders to really inform some of our work moving forward. So um, some of you may have seen that last year we ran a joint Be Flood Smart campaign with Flood Re, um, and that was um, to try and encourage um, more people to adopt PFR measures. And what we wanted to do was to ensure that people could see flood resilience options in a way that appealed to them. So rather than the, the sort of typical messaging of you're at risk, you need to do something about it. This was more along the lines of um, using sources of information that people would normally use to access home improvement information. So um, social media, for example, um, and then also showing them what, what could be done or showing them what people have done um, to improve their properties and, and encouraging people that way. So we work with a number of um, home improvers on social media um, to show people what flood resilience looks like or could look like and the range of different products and techniques that are out there um, in a way that challenged misconceptions um, that there might be around things like aesthetics in particular. So, so how particular products might look or um, how different design um, measures in a property might, might change the look and feel of a, of a house. And as I mentioned, as part of my introduction, um, everyone's different. Um, people take on information in different ways. So when engaging on our, our um, on our own schemes, um, schemes that we're delivering, we now recognize that the information that's provided to homeowners and communities and the choices and decisions um, that need to be made can be quite overwhelming. So we're building in a, a variety of different ways um, in which to engage. So using methods such as websites that people can dip in and dip out of and reflect on the information on there, um, drop-in sessions, webinars such as this one, um, door knocking, the floodmobile, et cetera. So lots of different ways to engage. And we're also considering the information that's provided on gov.uk. Um, it came out of the uh, the Pathfinder projects that that was um, the, the sort of go-to place that people look um, look towards for their information on, um, on flood risk and what they can do about it. So we're looking at the information that's on there and how we can change it to better fit the theory of change model that came out of our research. So giving people the right information on risk, then leading them into the different types of measures that they can adopt to manage um, that predicted level of risk. OK, next slide, please. Um, but with all of this, we need to exercise a bit of caution. Um, it's not as simple as, you know, as long as we understand people, then they will take action. Um, we recognize that there's a whole PFR ecosystem out there and we need to create the right conditions for people to make those informed decisions. So as well as the work on um, on behavioral insights, there continues to be a lot of work um, done by um, both ourselves, but also the wider PFR sector, um, looking at things like the cost of products and, and the lower cost options, product availability, the effectiveness of different types of measures, impact on insurance um, and in insurance premiums because um, so insights has shown that the more difficult it is to invest in resilience, the less likely people are to proceed. So how do we create the right conditions for people to then be in the right mindset and the right position to to invest in uh, in the right PFR measures? And with that, I'll hand back to Fola for the Q&A. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Juliet and Richard. I do love, it's not often that I get speakers that on time, and this is fantastic. I should have you guys more. Uh, so yeah, thanks about that. Uh, at least now, a lot of you, if you didn't know what the EA did in terms of uh, property flood resilience, you do now. 
uh, both their delivery, their support, and their strategy role, and every work or the big work they're trying to do to uh, help mainstream PFR. Now, uh, again, it's interesting to find out that even simple things like titling or framing of a project matters. Uh, and, and if we don't know already, uh, everyone's different. So when you're particularly dealing with PFR, which is can be quite personal, then people need a range of ways to actually get at them. So thanks very much for that. And uh, thanks for your questions that have been coming in. I'll try to go through some of them uh, so that we can try to answer them. Just check in. Yeah, all the people I need to see their faces are there. Fantastic. Uh, I'll start with one that seems to have a number of people interested in. Uh, from Owen, I had the opportunity to speak to various stakeholders in Windfleet following major flood event in 2019, and many people were hesitant to pursue PFR due to perceptions of uh, impact of PFR on insurance premiums. Uh, so just curious to hear how this type of protection could be addressed, uh, what resources are useful to signpost uh, people for that. Now, I know a lot has been done on here. Uh, not sure whether anyone is here from Flood Rib. I'm sure Mary and others will be able to share some insights on what you know people are doing about that. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer that because, funnily enough, about three weeks ago, or maybe a bit longer, I was in Waynefleet with the Floodmobile, and uh, uh, Floodmobile was almost flooded itself because there was so much water, so they were on a flood warning, and uh, people did come in their droves onto the Floodmobile to see me. Um, but one thing, um, you know, there's no stock answer to this, but um, one thing that I always say is, first of all, it... Um, property flood resilience, always be honest that you've got it. And I believe your insurer will smile sweetly on you on you because you're actually taking moves to reduce the risk to your own house, um, particularly if you're signed up for flood warning as well. And we've also got to remember that flood re isn't with us forever. It finishes in 2039 and people have got to be able to um, get uh, afford insurance on the risk reflective priced market. So actually um, proving, hopefully through the flood performance certificates that, that are in the making at the moment, a bit like energy performance certificates. So if you've got a flood door tick, a non-return valve tick or a flood resilient kitchen, it will give you a score and it will enable you to purchase flood insurance through the open market. So it will actually make property flood resilience a desirable thing to do rather than a grudge a grudge thing you've got to do and also it will help you sell your home having uh if the house is deemed at flood risk and everybody can easily find out the flood risk of a property and if you can prove that you've done all these wonderful rich uh, risk reduction measures and if the flood water gets in you can carry on living there um, having mopped up and sanitized and lit your fire and opened the windows, then all those things are positive, positive moves to PFR rather than negative. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Mary. Uh, I think sometimes people uh, still think that we're, we're, we're in the, they don't realize we're in the digital age. I mean, there's no, there's so much information out there, you know, when, when lawyers are doing their searches, they will find out the flood risk of your property so you can't hide it from them in fact so doing something about it yeah it's definitely a positive as opposed to a negative totally agree with that uh another question how do we deal with the uh, national media media perception of flooding and the role of uh authorities versus homeowner uh recent outlets sharing how councils do not help and lack of sandbags and things like that uh, you know, despite how they work or don't work. Uh, uh, so, so, so highways are expected to hand out uh, their limited supply despite things. So, so I guess this is all around, uh, uh, you know, uh, perceptions and, and, and education of people about uh, a flooding and about uh, the, 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 how sandbags work or not. Again, I do know what people like Mary and others do on that, but but you know, I mean, what what are people's thoughts? Uh, you know, Mary, yeah. Richard. 
do, do you want, yeah I'll, I'll come in on this one first thanks father um I mean, it's a really, really, really good question, um, and and it's it's something that I think we've all battled with as as flood risk professionals, um, and it's not just it's not just a problem with the media, um, but um, you know there there are lots and lots of people um, in positions of power who who we kind of need to influence to um, to actually um, get them to portray the 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 right tale. Um, uh, as, as far as flooding and, and PFR is concerned. So, you know, for example, the media um, always looking for a good story. So they won't go to a property, you know, apart from Nick and Annie, who, who got a lot of exposure um, this winter. But generally, they will go to a property which has got water in it and nothing to protect it to, to obviously convey the, the devastation. That's fair enough, but we also need to be portraying the other side of, of the picture as well of, of those people who've taken some really good um, actions as well. Um, I think with with the whole um, uh, sort of, you know, authorities versus homeowner, I think it, it just seems to be a, a, a sort of symptom of where we are as a country that we're always looking for somebody to blame. Um, so, you know, um, uh, if, if I've got water in my front room, I need somebody to blame. Therefore, it's my local authority's fault or it's the government's fault or it's the environment agency's fault. I think I think that the, the, there's a really interesting piece here that I don't have the answer to. And it may well form um, a part of um, a, a new research project, which is looking into getting people to take more ownership. Um, of their risk you know we we all take ownership of different elements of our property you know i've i've got a a lock on my front door and i make sure i lock it because you know the you, you never know who might wander in off the street i want to reduce my energy bills so my uh, my windows are, are are decent double glazing ones so actually how do we get people to take more responsibilities o uh, over their flood risk as well and not just expect somebody to protect their property for them and i, th I think that's as well um that needs to permeate through the the, the whole kind of um, sort of decision making ecosystem. So, you know, we've we've had examples of where um, uh, local authority flood risk officers have been telling members of the public, "Sorry, we don't provide sandbags," and yet, you know, a local councillor is. Um, uh, on the phone to his constituents or or in his community um, with his constituents saying, oh, yeah, we'll just go and get some from the local highways depot and bring them down. It needs to be one tail that permeates throughout throughout everything. And and yes, you know, there are things that that um, that local authorities, environment agency, um, others can help with. But the overriding message is it's it's my property i need to take ownership and i need to do something about that and i think that is the message that we want to convey can i just jump in there quickly sure. um i i everybody that knows me knows that i hate sandbags with a with a vengeance so i did take them to a testing tank and the the, the film is on youtube i tested four sandbags which is roughly what people get and four sandbags failed in 59 seconds from turning the water on. And 10, I gave them a chance. So I built a barrier of 10 sandbags and they failed in two minutes and five seconds from turning the water on. And you've got to remember as well, they're incredibly heavy. They get in very contaminated and they have to be paid to be disposed of in, in contaminated waste. So that's why I took it upon myself actually to test some, some gaffer tape because everybody or most people have got some gaffer tape lying about their house. And I am going to repeat the, the test because I got so excited I forgot to film it. But actually it did hold the water out for quite a long time. So I do take a piece of gaffer tape now on, on the floodmobile. And another thing I do say to people, and of course I'm really well placed to say it, having been flooded myself, that the Environment Agency and local authorities are charged with managing flood risk, not stopping it, and that we as homeowners wouldn't go away on holiday like Richard's alluded to and leave the door wide open and expect the local Bobby to keep an eye on it. And we don't think twice about burglar alarms or smoke alarms, so why not a self-closing air brick? And actually, because I say it, it is accepted so much better than somebody um, that maybe is charged with managing flood risks saying it because they're trying to pass the buck. I'm just telling it as it is. 
and I'm now trying to train up some more flood Mar Mary's angels, as I think uh, flood recalls them, to actually start saying the same. I've got a wonderful woman working with me, and she did a brilliant job in Scotland. Mary, I'm not sure whether the UK can meet with one more Mary, but I leave that for others to work. <laughs> uh, 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 again, Mary, uh, just just don't grab uh, a cup of tea yet, yeah, because unfortunately. You have stirred things up, even though you said the flood protection certificates are still on the way. Uh, loads of people want to know about it. So is there any inside story, a, a bit more you can tell people about it? As in, at the, at the, when uh, and how? Yep, certainly. I sit on something along with Richard, actually, called uh, the Property Flood Resilience Roundtable. It's sort of initi initiated with originally with DEFRA, and it's charged by, um, now chaired by Dermot Kehoe from Flood Re. And one of the things we wanted to do was incentivize the uptake of property flood resilience for when floodery is no longer here, because as I've said, it's a sticking plaster. So at the moment, it's uh, Richard may be able to sort of um, say a bit more, but it's with academics who are actually developing the assessment tool for it. And, and we have already trialed it uh, through with Floodery and with uh, Watertight International, who were doing um, a PFR scheme down in East Peckham, and the homeowners there were delighted to try it, trial it. And I know uh, they were given a score for uh, resistance and recoverability. Um, and also, um, I think there are more trials about to take place. And I know, for instance, that a lot of my case study people are really keen to, to be case studies. So, Richard, have you got anything else you want to say about? Yeah, yeah, that's that's um, um, that, that's essentially where we're up to, Mary. So um, the, the, the whole premise, as Mary described, is is to to kind of look at the energy performance certificate and, and think about what it could do for for flood risk. So. Um, so that there, yeah, there's a there's an academic piece going on at the moment to look at scoring. So how you go about looking at the risk to a property, how you go about looking at the different actions that people have already taken and quantifying that risk reduction. Um, so that piece of work is ongoing at the moment. Um, and then uh, we're also looking at sort of two elements to to the, the flood performance certificate if, if they are introduced. So one of them would be specifically around behavioral insights uh, and behaviors. So if you had a piece of paper saying you've got a particular score for your resilience, you know, would people then think, actually, I want to improve that if you then give them a measure, a, a, a menu of options, maybe with some costs as well about how they might go about doing that. So there's there's that behavioural element, but then there's also that link to um, sort of insurance and and um, other financial products as well. So you know, um, would would an insurer, for example, look more favourably upon somebody, you know, to to both um, offer them flood insurance, but also maybe give them a reduction if they've um, if they've introduced some measures into their into their property, and how that might work with. Um, with a flood performance certificate, so you know that the concept is out there. Um, uh, it, it's the, the the concept has been a, around for a, a couple of years. There's just some work going on now to figure out what they might look like, how the scoring might be done, and how they might be used in the future. Fantastic! Thanks for that. Uh, I've got a question from Alan. Now I don't actually know whether it's physically possible to unmute Alan to ask this, but I'll, I'll start reading it to, to, to start with, because really, uh, you know, Richard mentioned about some of these you know, for resilience path, you know, pathfinders. I know Rich, you know, Alan led one and there's one going on now. And linking to what, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what uh, has been talked about, uh, 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 what Juliet was talking about, is it says that with the six steps, uh, that, that's really good information and support on there for the final four, four steps. But the first two steps are the biggest challenge uh, uh, and really getting people on to start that journey is perhaps the most important. And it looks like there's some research which which which, uh, uh, which Alan has been involved with that probably shared some things. So I think it might be helpful if we're able to unmute Alan, if possible, to just frame that. And then I'll be interested to, to, to hear Juliet's thoughts on that. Is that possible? As Alan Ryan. Yes, it is. It is possible. Uh, 
that's what happens when you don't follow the, the, the rules. Uh, it's working, is it? Oh, there you go. Well, it, was, it was supposed to be a comment more than a question, but yeah, in, um, in our Pathfinder, um, we did across seven counties in the Oxcam region, um, baseline studies, and again, that one that jumped out to me is people will accept that flooding is a problem, they accept flooding is getting worse, but it's that own personal link to it, and 85% versus 15% highlighted a lot of the parts that we found, and I think it's once you can incentivize people to A, understand their flood risk and then B, take control like Richard was saying, then uh, for us, we're finding that's the biggest part of the battle. And once they're started, then there's lots of things like Siwem's work, the code of practice, the EAPFR framework, all support that. But when people refuse to actually accept our at risk or then say things like it affects the, the value of selling my property or it'll affect my insurance, we can't actually even all those other things that follow on research is the biggest problem. So anything I think that can help address those initial challenges would be of huge value. Fantastic. So over to you, Juliet. So again, from, from what you've presented, that those the challenge of moving past those first two steps, uh, you know, what are the answers? I think I'll just start with saying that's a very big question. <laughs> I think if I had the answers, we'd be all fine. Um, I guess kind of my reflections on it are that it feels like um, you've kind of hit the nail on the head about the kind of dynamic nature of flood risk. And on top of that, I guess, of climate change and, cli and impacts of climate in the UK. Um, and I think that, that I suppose there's a a kind of a point around education and this kind of ongoing conversation between the public and the RMAs and the residents and the media to kind of um, have more awareness. Because I think the point on the sandbags, um, before I had this role, I did a PhD looking at flood risk in Rochdale and I spoke to lots of residents who were flooded and they, I think they felt that um, sandbags were this sort of visual symbol of of as a, of a flood defense and if you haven't got really good education if you this is the first time you're being flooded you may not understand exactly all the different ways that you can um have property flood resilience and also all of the things that are required to, to do to manage your own flood risk and i think until someone knows that it's a risk then how would we know about all of the various things you need to do um and kind of what the ex what our expectations are of our kind of governance around us as residents in terms of protecting us from these things so I think there's sort of it's not it's not an easy answer but for me I think that's that seems to be an ongoing conversation and education kind of um point and I think someone else put, put a question in about kind of ongoing campaigns around flood awareness and I can see that being something that could be a really useful way to kind of carry on those conversations I can see Richard's unmuted so um he's got something to add yeah I was just going to say that we we do an annual survey um to, to look at people's perceptions of flood um, and every single year it comes out that that people are, are, are not checking their risk they're not aware of their risk they're not preparing um, so I, I think I think you know if, if it's something that happens every year or um, you know several times a year like Mary described with Nick and Annie for example there is that inherent onus um, on that person or, or that willingness from that person to invest and do something about it because they know it's just going to happen and keep happening. I think I think the more challenging um, demographic is those who perhaps might only flood once every five years, once every 10 years, once every 15 years. You know, where's the incentive for those people to actually take action? So I think I think we, we probably need to segregate it into into different sort of groupings with those who are extremely high risk. OK, they they you know they're likely to be aware of it. They're likely to be taking action anyway. Um, there's that next group that kind of you know will flood frequently but not as frequently who are the next candidates who should be taking action so yeah um it, it, it is difficult to 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 kind of engage with people so i think we do need to start looking at sort of new and innovative ways to to, to get some of those messages across and can i just add something there's, there's there's nothing like a good flood is there <laughs> and um the, when i've been traveling around with the flood mobile into flood hit communities there's a broad acceptance now that this is climate change. It's 
climate change in action and it's going to get worse. I heard it from almost everybody. I would say it to people and people would agree with me or people would say it. And because of that, people were really kind, really keen to find out what they could do at a property level to reduce their own risk, even if it meant just planning and moving their car. Everybody wanted to know for the first time ever, I feel there's been a shift change because of this terrible winter. Yes, yes, it's been on and on and on, hasn't it? Yes. Uh, I know if a couple of a few questions have come together, all linking to new homes uh, type things. So some, you know, one from Fiona, how do we avoid avoid building new homes in areas at high risk of flooding? Mm -hmm. um, and and the one from Markham, again, sort of links into what we're talking about. Should house house builders not be encouraged to design new properties with future flooding in mind? In, in essence, you know, should, should, should we not be designing materials to, to, to be used, you know, that, that protect against flood risk and inbuilt PFR and all that? And, and, and you know, uh, also Gareth, uh, Gareth Boyd, again, talked about the fact that recoverability measures, because of the scale and what they are, tend to be done at times of, of home adaptations. Again, if we're building new buildings, uh, perhaps some of those things we can put in there then, then in the first year. So just interested in thoughts as to, I mean, we recognize that planning, MPPF, the, the planning does say that uh, you're, we're not expected to use property flood resilience to make a property that's in the wrong place right. In essence, it's only really about dealing with uh, uh, the residual flood risk, but most of what we're talking about here are existing developments that are already where they are, but interested to see thoughts of the panel on new developments and perhaps whether we can be you know especially the more recoverable recoverable bits you know the, the the building regs whatever you know whether we can do better yeah i'll i'll, I'll start with this one, this one further so i think I've, I've probably just got to say right from the very outset that uh you know we shouldn't be using pfr measures to justify building houses in uh, in high risk locations um planning policy is is pretty strong um and says that flood uh, says that new development should be directed to areas at lowest risk so let's start off with that one as uh, as a line in the sand but I, th I think i think you're right you know there there is um a role that building race could play um because um you know we have published flood maps but they're never going to be perfect and um we can we can see in some locations which are not identified as being at risk you know may suffer from things like surface water flooding which which can be very flashy um and uh, and not necessarily picked up um at all times or um block sewers or all sorts of other types of risks that there are out there so i think i think you know, we, we, we should be starting off with the position of, of 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 trying to design out flooding. So those passive measures, so raising floor levels, et cetera. But you know, I think I think for all properties, looking at some of those um uh interventions which are relatively low cost and easy for developers to implement straight away because that that will inevitably um be one of the, the the key considerations you know what what impact this will have on um developers costs and therefore what they will be passing on to their homeowner um if if they're sort of relatively um, low cost or cost neutral then you know, I, I take the view of why wouldn't we um, look at um, implementing some of those? So, you know, as Mary says, if, if you're looking at air bricks, why not look into self-closing air bricks or, you know, just looking at some of those different types of plaster that you can put on the walls or, or just simple things like that, raising your electrics, you know, that helps with disability requirements as well as as well as flood risk management. So I, I think there is a role there. Um, and, and as we've said, with climate change, risks are only going to increase. So if we're expecting properties to be there for 100, 100 plus years, you know, let's look at some of those design changes now. Fantastic. Uh, now, we've got loads of other fantastic questions. Uh, good news is we've got another question and answer session after this. Uh, but really, remember remains to thank uh, Mary, Juliet and Richard for your presentations and answers and for all of you for your great questions. I'd like to move on to the next set of uh, uh, our third presentation, which is another joint one, this time from Fran Comin at Rochdale Borough Council and Paul O'Hare from Manchester Metropolitan University. Now, they're 
both going to present an approach to delivering PFR and tackling flood poverty. Uh, I intentionally saw some questions relating to flood poverty, also insurance and, and, and rental. I left them because I know they've been doing some great work in that area. Their presentation will cover understanding of impact of uh, deprivation and flood resilience and understand what they can do to improve the uptake of PFR and deliver a resilient ROCH. Fran is the service manager for strategic planning at Rochdale uh, Borough Council, which includes the Mid Local Flood Authority, spatial planning policy, and strategic environmental projects and programs. Golly, well, that's a lot of work, Fran. <laughs> that's why work. I don't look 21 years old anymore, Fola. And on top of that, you are leading the uh, Resilient Roach project as well. You know, which, uh, as people might know, is one of the uh, DEFRA flood and coastal resilient pro uh, uh, innovation program. Paul uh, is a senior lecturer in uh, urban geography at Manchester Metropolitan University. He's conducted research into climate adaptation and contribution of public and civil society organizations to risk management. And Paul is also involved in the Resilient Roach project. So again, remember, we're going to have another Q and A. So feel free to be putting your questions there and ticking others while we hand over to Fran and Paul. Okay, th thank you, Fola. Um, are we bringing up the presentation now? Yes, it should come up by magic. <laughs> there we go, fabulous. Okay, uh, so good afternoon, everybody, um, and thanks for the introduction, Fola. Um, this is ostensibly about the Rochdale Flood Poverty Project, which was funded through the Northwest Regional Flood and Coastal Committee, and we'll be publishing the report formally in the summer. We have a, a draft which has just been formatted at the moment, so if anybody is interested in um, finding out more about the report. Um, if you contact Paul or myself, we can um, we can share some more of the findings with you. Um, I think Fola can probably put contact, or Paul can put contact details in the uh, in the chat for that. Um, so if you could move on to the first slide, please. So this is a, a heat map, which really just shows us the project areas that we looked at. Um, two quite different geographical areas, the Wardleworth area of central Rochdale and a typical older urban inner area in many respects, um, older terrace properties, cheek by jowl with the river and its main tributaries, uh, built up through the industrial uh, development of Rochdale um, and uh, you know, former uh, factory lands within the area. But the floodplain, of course, largely developed other than in, in, in small bursts. So um, the, the area is quite densely developed. Um, it is an area which has uh, significant uh, IMD um, characteristics, um, some within the top 3%, considerable amount within the top 10, and virtually everything in the top 20% of the worst IMD uh, for um, uh, multiple deprivation. And uh, it's a predominantly, uh, it's got a, a significant ethnic mix, um, predominantly uh, from Pakistani and Bangladeshi um, uh, uh, families, um, but, but uh, there's an, up, an older cohort of long-term residents and, um, and it's, it's a community which is quite transi transitory. Uh, there's a, a lot of rented property, whether that be socially rented or private rented, and because of that, then there's a lot of people moving in and out of the area. Um, Littleborough is slightly different. It's higher up the River Roach catchment, and it has some shared similarities in terms of its industrial development, uh, albeit it's on the Pennine fringes of the uh, of, of Rochdale Borough, and the South Pennine Moors are cheap by jowl with the with the with the town of Littleborough itself. Um, it's not as strongly deprived as um, central as the Wadleworth cluster in central Rochdale, um, but it has, um, in some respects, a more complex series of deprivation in that there's more hidden deprivation. And Paul might say a little bit more about this when he comes to uh, his findings. Um, 
both communities are at very high risk from river flooding and um, and surface water flooding. And I think the heat map shows the uh, flooded prop properties which are previously flooded um, in the 2015 uh, floods from Storm Eva, primarily the Boxing Day 2015 flooding. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. Okay. Uh, Paul, I think you're going to say a little bit yep. about what you did now in terms of the uh, the piece of work. Yep. Thank, thanks, Fran. Thanks, uh, Fola. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Just going to talk a little bit about uh, the report, the flood poverty report. Uh, just a quick acknowledgement of our of our sponsors, which was the Northwest uh, RFCC. So thanks to them for uh, funding uh, funding the research. The research itself um, started with a. a a, a desk-based review, some of the most recent literature and some of the most recent policy and practice um, in the uh, in the area of flood risk management with specific, specific regard to the social justice dimensions uh, of that. As Fran has alluded to, we conducted quite extensive social vulnerability uh, mapping across the two areas. We also conducted questionnaires with, uh, we got 103 uh, responses, which was, which was quite good out of a um, around about 400 properties uh, that we uh, that we approached. Beyond that as well, we conducted uh, what we have referred to as a PFR health check on 162 properties. So going into properties where PFR had been uh, fitted previously, um, making an assessment of just how effective uh, that PFR uh, remained several years after its initial installation. We conducted workshops, focus scripts, um, and semi-structured interviews, particularly uh, with members of the public, uh, community leaders and beyond that, uh, for example, key stakeholders such as, for for instance, um, insurers, uh, local insurers, and also uh, national insurers, uh, particularly insurers interested in social uh, housing uh, provision of insurance for social housing uh, properties. So, just to very quickly just run through that, that that's what we did. So, full, full if you go to the next slide, please. These are the uh, headline. Uh, findings of the uh, of of the work. What we found was perhaps unsurprisingly uh, there was a strong association, both correlation and we suspect causation uh, between uh, flood risk and deprivation. And we also uh, suspect that flooding drives deprivation, and deprivation can also drive flood risk uh, as well. And if anybody wants to explore that a, a, a bit more, very happy to to return to that in the Q in the Q and A's to explain. Um, our, our, our thought process uh, behind that. We found that um, we need to begin to exploit um, opportunities to begin to address what's referred to as residual risk, so the risk that's left uh, over um, behind um, behind the flood defences, for example. I quite liked um, probably your observation at the uh, start of the afternoon where you talk about how PFR it's quite evasive. It, it it goes into people's uh, goes into people's homes. And that presents an opportunity for flood risk management, for innovative flood risk management. But it's really difficult because it is invasive. It is it, it is you know moving into people's uh, very sacred, very personal uh, living spaces. For for example, and in order to do this, we need to uh, take very careful what we've referred to as cross sectoral approaches. Um, around service delivery and around policy development as well. And I will go on to explain that um, over the next couple of slides uh, as well. I think we have to be very careful. And I know um, uh, previous speakers have been, uh, you know, have extolled the virtues of PFR. And I think we would uh, pretty much uh, agree that PFR certainly has its place. But we have to be very careful because what we find um, in Rochdale is that we, we can't make the assumption uh, that uh, property owners will uh, maintain PFR um, interventions without sustained support and without intervention, perhaps from third parties. So, for example, from the local authority um, and from thousand providers. And I think there's a really interesting discussion, really interesting debate. And we got round to that, I think, um, uh, through uh, uh, Juliet and Richard's uh, presentation around where responsibility lies for that. And I think that that, that could be a really interesting uh, point to, to perhaps return to in the, in the Q&A session. Uh, as as well, I think there are other very important actors at play here. We need to think about how the insurance industry can be recruited uh, to uh, to to the cause of addressing flood risk, uh, poverty, and flood risk um, injustice as well. And in particular, how do we penetrate what um, we would refer to as challenging 
markets. And again, I'll, I'll go on to explain that in over the next couple of slides as well. And at the end of the next few slides, I'm going to pass back to, to Fran, who's going to talk about our uh, Rochdale FCRIP uh, project, Resilient Roach, which really provides an opportunity to exploit some of these opportunities that we've identified through this piece of research, which looks specifically at blood poverty. Next slide, please, Fulva. So, as I mentioned, I think that there is potentially a misplaced expectation um, on household and property owners to maintain uh, PFR. And we have to be very careful about um, making the assumption that communities and individual household uh, householders um, and, and, rent, and, and renters know what PFR is, know how it works, even where it has uh, been installed in their properties previously. Um, and again, as I, as I mentioned, this, I think, gets to the heart of this discussion uh, that, that Richard perhaps touched upon earlier about the idea for, of responsibility. What I'd suggest, though, is that even when people are willing to accept responsibility, um, in order to then follow that up with a maintenance regime, with, a, with regular checks, um, that, that can be quite a, a big ask, particularly in, in communities that are, quite frankly, struggling to, to, to put food on the table and wondering how they're going to pay uh, their utility bills at the, at the end of the week or at the end of the month. So I think we need to really understand um, community dynamics and all of the other challenges that that, that communities and individual house uh, households face, and um, you, you know take heed of that and acknowledge that and and begin to identify opportunities where we might be able to address yes flood risk management, but also how we can do that in a way uh, that also addresses some of those other concerns, uh, some of those other challenges uh, as well. So what we've really identified in Rochdale is that support is required. Support is required uh, both from um, a local uh, government perspective. And of course, we get into the, that, the thorny question about who, who pays for that, who, who funds that, knowing the, the squeeze that local government continues to be under and will be under for, for the foreseeable future, it would seem. But also um, where support can perhaps be provided through civil society organisations, the infrastructure networks that might already uh, be in place in communities. So absolutely, we think that uh, PFR has a role to play in flood risk management and particularly in residual flood risk, flood risk management, but the context uh, to this is absolutely vital. So for instance, resistance measures in particular, they need to be complete. So uh, we can install lots of uh, aperture barriers in a, in, a, in a property, for example, and they will perhaps work fine, but the property will still flood if the point in the brickwork uh, hasn't been maintained properly. So we need to think about the the, the whole system uh, of, uh, of of a building, not just how, uh, not just the, the the PFR bits of kit and technology. Um, we've conducted work in Rochdale to um, address um, other challenges. So, for example, energy efficiency uh, challenges, beginning to identify how we can align those with flood risk uh, management interventions as well, and also to look at vulnerability uh, in the round as well. So raising critical questions about social inequality and how flooding drives and is driven by poverty and begin to think about how we can address flood risk, not necessarily through just PFR, but through um, other interventions. So, for example, um, encouraging people to, to look at um, debt management and whenever they're, they're doing that, perhaps you know, using that as an opportunity to identify how some money can go in uh, each and every week into um, a better insurance scheme for instance. But the only way we can do that is to address some of the other challenges that, that people face whenever it comes to balancing uh, the weekly the weekly budget. So really taking a holistic approach uh, to this and, and, and sensitizing our interventions to, uh, to, to, to ensure that uh, they uh, pay regard to the challenges that, uh, that, that communities face. As I mentioned uh, earlier, there's, there's quite a squeeze um, on uh, local authority uh, budgets. Um, the recent steep increase in inflation uh, has made uh, PFR even less affordable. It's also widened the gap between uh, the rather static uh, DEFRA grant that's available and real life costs and ability to plug this gap becomes so much more challenging for councils as uh, they become, um, as people look to them for support, but also as their budgets are increasingly uh, constrained. I think we need to also acknowledge uh, as well that um, the target communities for PFR, so the communities that we might want to see more PFR um, penetrating, aren't themselves a properly functioning uh, market at the moment. The market um, takes a lot of support 
it's very reactive. It's, it can also be very uh, grant dependent as well. And our work really begins to look at how we can introduce more creative approaches to get PFR and household resilience funded through new cross-sectoral uh, approaches. So for instance, it's not just about flooding, it's also about looking at how we can drive up housing standards, how we can improve the fabric uh, of, the, of the build quality um, in the communities that we're, that we're working in. And also looking at how landlords can be encouraged to make changes uh, to their own practice. We can also look for here, uh, for example, at how we can align flood risk management policy with other agendas, such as fuel poverty uh, agendas and, and more generic uh, poverty alleviation uh, agendas or regeneration um, agendas. And how we can also align this with a much broader investment in, for example, housing stock. Uh, next slide, please, Fuller. So um, just to, to, to pull some of these strands uh, together, um, we need to, um, you know, particularly whenever it comes to housing and, and property management, it's really important, I think, to understand uh, local market conditions and the challenges of this and the, and the local pressures, the national pressures, yes, but also the local pressures that, that, that might be brought to play um, on, a housing, uh, on a housing market. It's a problem uh, for both tenanted um, and, and owned properties, but I think it's really a particularly pernicious problem whenever it comes to, uh, to, to the rental sector. We found in, in Rochdale, and the same will be true in lots of other communities as well, in many communities, landlords buy properties for high-yielding rental returns, but they don't actually make a medium to long-term um, investment in them. So over time, the housing stock, uh, yes, it changes hands very quickly. There's a very vibrant um, uh, an almost cutthroat market uh, for, uh, for for both buying buy to let properties and also then trying to rent those properties, but it, it's not actually being translated into long term investment in the uh, in the properties uh, property stock. Intermediary organisations um, are also very important uh, as well, particularly letting agents and managing agents. But in the work that we've conducted in Rochdale, and again, I'm pretty sure this will be uh, this will be true in other areas. Uh, those individuals in that sector doesn't always accept uh, responsibility uh, for flood risk management. So the question there is, how do we work with those sectors? How can we identify, um, um, you know, carrots, um, incentivization to work with them? And also possibly, is there some regulation that we might uh, be able to, uh, to, to, to potentially identify the, at, a, at a local level? level. One example of this is the Greater Manchester Landlord uh, Landlord Charter, which does now, hopefully, it's, it's, it's still in development, but hopefully that will identify opportunities to where, whereby um, the rental sector can, can, can pay more attention to, to flood risk. Financial resilience is very important um, in, here, uh, in here as well, uh, whereby we can identify uh, problems in that market. So, for example, the loss of local um, insurance brokers, a focus on the digital and also limited understanding of the need and value for insurance. How we can also identify how insurance is not just about affordability and accessibility, um, but also how um, in, we can make sure that communities and individuals are buying appropriate insurance, because there's one thing worse than not having any, ins um, any insurance at all, and that's having uh, insurance that perhaps can cover people for flood risk. So improving uh, the literacy and the understanding um, around that. So just to uh, to draw these uh, draw these themes together a little bit, uh, we really need to uh, work on flood and climate uh, literacy, which again has been mentioned by previous speakers. Uh, we're certainly we have a crack that um, in, in in Rochdale, but we're we're, we're trying to, to to really boost that and work very hard to to boost that at a at a local level, not just with communities and members of the public, but also other organisations, professional stakeholders, for example. So we're developing training for debt advisors, for housing officers, and for um, insurance brokers. We need to recognize uh, the plurality of communities. There's no such thing as a singular community. There are lots of different intersecting, overlapping sub-communities, and that needs very careful uh, navigation, particularly against the context uh, where social cohesion, perhaps in some communities, isn't quite uh, what we would hope it would be. And also beginning to engage with the what, what I like to refer to is that as a, as a rich ecosystem of groups and entities that are already in existence, how we can uh, tap into those to those bodies and organizations and and, and begin to um, encourage them to to push in the same direction as us. As Fran has noted, uh, the report is not quite out yet, but um, 
um, ho hope to get that out um, over over the next uh, couple uh, next few months. Um, and uh, we've listed a whole series of findings and recommendations. What we really want to do, and this is where I'm going to hand back uh, to Fran, what we've started to identify is how we can exploit some of the challenges in Rochdale and begin to identify how we can pursue them through more innovative interventions through the Resilient Roach project. At that point, I'll, I'll hand over to Fran. Okay, thanks, Paul. I, I'm I'm conscious of time, so I'll I'll kind of go through this quite quickly. Um, when you do eventually see the report, one of the things you will see in the chapters is where we've actually identified the next steps for where things will be taken forward, uh, and this is largely in in the first instance through our work in the FCRIP program, the Resilient Roach Project. Uh, could you move on a slide, please? So the resilient. Roach project is, it, it takes the themes which are there, which to some extent are, are self-evident. Um, but as Paul uh, has, has alluded to, it does tackle this circular link between flooding and deprivation and the evidence base that the Flood Poverty Project has provided and some of the initial piloting of ideas and uh, understanding of the issues has been uh, very, very helpful in helping us to form this program and, and some of the areas and where we're going to test and demonstrate and try to pilot new approaches that hopefully can be both mainstreamed locally and will provide a body of encouragement and, um, and, and good evidence for how to take things forward elsewhere. Uh, next, please. So again, uh, some of these things will be very much what you've just heard from, from Paul. Um, but it's working across sectors at a local level, but perhaps in new ways. And again, it's this um, approach where flooding need not be the flag bearer. It's something which is embedded within a, a set of investments or programs or, or business as usual approaches increasingly where flood resilience becomes business as usual. And, and, and it allows that wider scope for investment rather than just through the traditional sources of granting aid or um, recovery grants, et cetera, after a flood event. And operational delivery really offers this, this best way of dealing with, with, with residual risk. And in our case, this is predominantly going to be working with our, our housing sector through our housing service and how we actually um, work with social housing providers, with local landlords and with local residents in the communities to create that resilience, but it's sustainable. And we're looking at opportunities where we can embed inspection, uh, resilient repair, and, uh, and other support opportunities, um, um, such as training street champions who will be there to welcome new neighbors, uh, all sorts of things at all sorts of scales to actually just keep that community memory and that community capacity and capability as high as possible. Um, we're working at all scales from catchment to property level. So it's everything from NFM in the outer rims through to property level resilience and also property level suds. So looking at how things such as water butts and uh, community rain gardens or, or, or rain gardens at the property scale actually commute accumulatively can help. It's the integration of intervention, interventions holistically. Paul's referred to this. We, we again, we don't use flooding as the headline. It's housing standards, it's climate resilience, and it's future proofing. It's those things which are actually the, the, the headlines here to just make um, decent decent homes which will which will stand the test of time, and this will aid community cohesion in 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 in, in how we do this. Hopefully, um, again. We've got a, 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 a wide stakeholder presence and involvement from local residents and businesses through to local, uh, local regional and national uh, stakeholder bodies. Um, and we have a longstanding relationship with the National Flood Forum, who've built superb relationships within these communities, have become a very trusted partner and a very trusted presence in these communities. And we'll continue to use that to work with them with, um, for example, faith groups and other community sectors and business um, forums to actually keep this live. And one of the things we'll also be doing is to create hubs. We've purchased buildings which are currently being um, refurbished and will we'll ultimately be a permanent hub to provide advice, training, surgery events, et cetera, for insurance, PFR, et cetera. And they're in the heart of the community. That physical presence will always be there. Next, please. 
Um, again, it's the three things, uh, just to kind of almost summarise. Um, it's how that the housing programme, where we're combining this energy efficiency, housing condition and PFR, and they're not exclusive. They do uh, interact as well. So, for example, um, a, a good quality pointing, good quality flood doors, etc., are going to add to energy efficiency because they're keeping more heat in the property. It's uh, they, they all kind of contribute. It's a kind of a circular benefit for all these measures. Again, the Paul's alluded to the sub market for insurance, uh, which we want to try and create that uh, that basis for a market where insurance becomes something that is accessible and affordable and is increasingly seen as essential by residents, tenants, landlords, etc. And bringing all these things together in an integrated way, I think, as all speakers have said, there's no individual element on its own which is going to work here. It's got to be an integrated approach uh, across physical, social and financial interventions and from the individual to the to the catchment scale. Next. And this is just an example of some of the partners that we're working with to conclude. Um, some of the usual suspects, but some there which um, you wouldn't normally be seen in, um, in, in, in a list of flood uh, resilience kind of partnerships, uh, OVO Energy and Groundwork Energy Works, et cetera. But again, it's, it's showing that it's, it's increasingly a bigger shared agenda where we're embedding flood resilience in wider investment. And it's this circular benefit that we're creating. And I think we'll leave it at that. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Fran and Paul. Uh, we've always thought that, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you know, where, where you have a property flood resilience, uh, something in your property, if it's yours, it's your responsibility. But it's interesting that we've seen some, uh, some interesting thoughts uh, that sometimes, depending on you know the the actual people and financial circumstances, it might not be that simple. Uh, I'll move on now to uh, the next one, which is a slightly different format, where Paul Schaffer from Saiwan will have a virtual fireside conversation with Ricky House, Henry Locke, and Rebecca Potter, all from Arcadis, to discuss approaches to project managing and delivering PFR as opposed to just traditional uh, schemes. Now, Ricky is a chartered engineer, been working flood defense since about 89, uh, involved with PFR since about 2013. I've been involved in a number of projects, including recently one in Cornwall and a couple in Devon. Uh, Henry is a project manager at Arcadis, mostly works on uh, environment agencies, uh, collaborative delivery framework, delivering flood resilience schemes as a managing agent. Uh, and uh, has, has really uh, yeah, developed quite a lot of properties through that. And Becca is an assistant project manager at Arcadis, working on uh, multiple uh, uh, flood protection projects of varying sizes. Uh, and, and the three of them will be uh, having interesting chats with Paul, who is the director of innovation and delivery at Cywin. Uh For those who don't know Paul, I'll be surprised if anyone here doesn't, uh, Paul is responsible for the Be Flood Ready community of practice and has been involved in development, delivery, and sharing of good practice and water management, including flood resilience for over 20 years. Flo uh, Paul is the project manager for Be Flood Ready. Over to you now, Paul. Okay, so thank you, Fola. And uh, also thank you, Becca, Ricky, and, and Henry for the session, really. It's following up discussions that we've had really about the differences between managing managing flood risk with traditional schemes and managing it with property flood resilience. So it'd be really good to understand what typically have your roles been in managing flood protection projects. And I suppose it's probably really for Ricky to kick us off with really on that one. Yes. Um, our roles uh, in as a managing agent have been throughout the uh, duration of a um, PFR scheme, initially in packaging and in the tendering of the process for the delivery. Um, packaging in certainly when we were working in Cornwall was quite important because um, rather than like the maps you were recently looking at at Rochdale, uh, where the properties were fairly clustered together. In Cornwall, we had one project and it was scattered all across uh, the entire county. And that meant 
uh, pulling things together in a in a, as an efficient a manner as possible was not as easy as it first thought. And sometimes it's just physically getting from site to site was uh, quite difficult. Um, but once we've got a, a, a package together, we would help through the tender process and we would then go on to a, a project management role throughout the de delivery. Now that delivery would include the surveys, the uh, procurement and the installation of the uh, facilities that were being put in. Um, in many respects, it's a fairly traditional project management role, managing communications and finances and so forth. But um, I think it's very important to note with PFR that you need an organization to help glue everything together. You have a client, you have a contractor, which is fairly traditional. You have a designer or surveyor in this case. In many respects, fairly traditional. But then you have the client, the one at the end, the people who are benefiting from this. And it's very important to realize that unlike anywhere else, you have where you have one client in a PFL project, you may have 10, 20, 50 or 100 clients. And that needs a different approach. And that's where we come along to help facilitate the work done by the delivery teams, the surveyors and the contractors, who, to be fair, they're the ones who do all the work. What we come along to do to help make their job a lot easier. Um, the second role we also play is in giving the end user, the client whose homes we're going into, uh, a second port of call if there are issues which they are, they feel they, they're not being heard as well as they might be. Usually they have the front facing person from the surveyor and then transferring into the installer, but having someone else they can go to who can take on board um, some of those uh, concerns, um, I think is very important. And being embedded into the overall scheme enables a managing agent to um, deliver something tangible to aid the scheme as a whole. So that's really what we're looking at. Um, it's, it, as I say, a, a lot of the work is the traditional project management role, but there is, it's that extra bit that we do for PFR, which I think is very important. Thank, thanks, Ricky. And I suppose, Henry, in the past, we were talking about some of the key differences and, Ricky started to touch on that with regards to the interactions that you might have with many people. I, I just, are there any other key differences that you, you just wanted to bring out? Yeah, well, just, just honing in, when you look at uh, sort of a typical large, more conventional flood uh, risk and resilience schemes, you typically deal with a community of stakeholders as represented by, say, one person championing that. Now, a PFR, you've got fundamentally say you've got 30 properties it's 30 little schemes 30 individual schemes within that uh, and they're all individuals or families whoever um, all have a lot of different requirements in communications so how much communication how often what levels of information which is really quite frankly different to larger schemes and also because as it's been spoken about for the last couple of hours here it's, it's very personal personal for the for these individuals so you can't talk about these schemes by and large of we're building this up river it will protect your flood sorry your houses in this way you have to deal with each individual uh in in the way they prefer so you know as a result of that the way you communicate things is a lot different greater levels of empathy sensitivity for example um yeah and that's the main bit it's it's the yeah the quantum level of individuals who are dealing with in these schemes. Uh, and, and another just a quick point on that is the sort of geographic reach of these schemes, you know, as they're done uh, in an area of a flood risk management authority or a local authority, they're not contained to, you know, one sort of 20 meter section of river. They can be dotted all around the county uh, and you will have different nuances between areas, even differences on 
actual roads, for example. So it's just quite how dynamic it is compared to a sort of standalone flood asset, which is which is quite strange moving into, but um, something to be very mindful of in delivering in future. Cheers, Henry. Thank you. And I, I, I suppose really is also it's just been really cognizant of the different professions and skills that are involved in PFR delivery. Uh, and I imagine there's quite a lot of moving pieces. So, Becca, how how, have you, how do you manage that process and, and the interaction of all the different professions and skill sets that come, come with PFR? Sorry, I struggled to unmute myself there. Um, yeah, so I, well, I was lucky enough on all three of my schemes to work with an amazing team um, of different professions, like you say. So, obviously, you start with a client who kind of lay out what they want to do, but we fed into that quite a lot into the tender process um recommendations on like ricky pointed on i think cornwall was the biggest scheme so far that i've worked on and like looking at clusters and identifying properties which were good to work on before we've even got the contractor and surveyor involved um so once we've gone through the tender getting them involved was great because obviously they're the ones that know know it inside and out they're the ones that will be going to the properties and installing these um and it is their profession but the residents don't have that information so i think one big thing that we started off with is providing a flow chart of the overall process because so many people are coming to their houses and um like henry said it's quite a personal thing to them and i think the cornwall world started during covid so we also had that like mixed in so people were nervous about that nervous about people coming once we'd got the contract and the surveyors in place, we um, we sent out a, a, a letter, I think, letting them know that, you know, these are people to expect, starting off with a surveyor, then going on to the contractor. But also as part of that, it was advised by, um, by the uh, surveyor that um, pictures of the individuals that were coming and their names and who to expect was, um, I think that went down really well because then people weren't daunted by these random people turning up so they kind of knew all of that in terms of on our side on the project side making sure that every all the information was collated as well as could be we um set up a spreadsheet which was a live tracker because as you can imagine we were getting phone calls phone calls were going to different people within the project team so i was picking some up so were the contractors um and it just meant that we could keep this live thing going where we're all up to date with what's been discussed with the residents. So there's no crossover with things like that. And I think finally, this, this spreadsheet allowed for documentation because there's so much documentation going out. So once the surveyors finish with their work, they'll provide documents for each property, which then gets handed over to the contractor. We kept a track of all that documentation all the way through to make sure that we got the right things in place. Brilliant. So, okay, thanks, Becca. So it sounds like there's a, quite a lot of effort involved in terms of managing expectations and making sure that those that have been flooded and you're doing the work on the properties are aware of what's going on so that the reducing that chances of uncertainty and I, th I think what what's been clear throughout the afternoon is the the different approach that's required to work with people in their homes and, and we often refer to a uh, home being someone's castle so I, I suppose really thinking about the skill set that's required traditionally as opposed to PFR. Uh, Ricky, I, I don't know whether there's something that you want to explain with regards to the skill sets and behaviours as project managers you need when you are dealing with people that have gone through quite upsetting, well, really upsetting and stressful process, and you're in there making changes to their homes. And I just wondered what 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 skill sets do, do, do you as project managers and other PFR professionals need? I think it's essential to be uh, people orientated and to be able to focus on those people's concerns and not be just a corporate body representing a corporate approach. It's a very personal thing, as has been said throughout every single talk we've had this afternoon. It's um, you're a visitor in someone's home and you should behave in that way and you should treat it with the respect it deserves 
And also you touched on about the fact that most of the people that we would go to have probably been, had suffered from flooding and it's being able to understand the impact of actually someone of having their home invaded by an in, unstoppable force, if you like, which is when water is uncontrolled, that's exactly what it is. And that has an impact on people and you've got to understand it. And I think it doesn't matter how good you might be at the project management side and the technical side and the design side, when you're actually standing in front of these people, it's the people side which is more important than all of that put together. And that's where choosing the right sort of people to go in and do that work and to do that front-facing approach is very important. And I, I, I can't emphasize this enough in that respect. It makes the overall management process behind that and the, the, to deliver these projects a lot easier if you have good front-facing people who engage with the people who are affected and they engage with the people whose property uh, you, th that you're getting involved in. You, uh, to a certain extent, you're there to do a job, but from their perspective, it's so much more and you yeah. need to recognize that. And that's something which I think it's very easy as professionals in flood defense uh, we can sometimes get a bit blasé because we deal with it all the time. And we've, in some experience, some of us have actually ex experienced flooding. Um, but because we go into places like this on a regular basis, it, it can be a, it be a little, um, get a bit impersonal. And there's a degree of protection you build up again in yourself. And I think you've got to be able to get over that and engage. Yeah. You need to bring your, your true self to to the workplace and and treat people on a, on an equal level, equal footing, and make sure they understand what's going on yeah. in simple terms. Yeah, Brilliant. show that you care. Show that you care as a person as much as a corporate body. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, it's human to human. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. great. Thank you for that. So we've talked about some of the challenges, and I also think it'd be useful to talk about the rewards. So. Henry, can you just run through some of the typical challenges you find? And Becca, countering that side, because it can't all be challenge and, and problems. There's got to be, there has got to be some reward in, in what you're doing in terms of giving people peace of mind. So Henry, if you want to start yeah. to know what some of the typical challenges you, you might face. Are yeah, I'll, do, I'll state the issues with a smiling face, of course, because you can, you can work through them. Um, so notwithstanding comments already raised about the, the stakeholder landscape is quite difficult. I won't rehash that again. Uh, one thing I think is common across all our projects is the really complex regulatory and permitting constraints we've experienced um, on our schemes. So, of course, whilst it is very important um, to, to get properties flood resilient, I've had, I think, 30% of the properties in my area were in a conservation area. Now, this doesn't automatically allow products to be installed. They have to be in keeping with the historic nature of the uh, surrounding communities and roads. Um, it can actually be quite frustrating to, to deliver to that standard when, you know, naturally it's, it's a very important bit of installation that's being done. Nonetheless, in overcoming that, you know, if you can ensure at an early stage how many properties are required to get permitting permission also getting on board with the permitting teams at the local councils to ensure they do understand the importance of what we're doing typically they can review applications at a quicker pace and some properties can be exempt if you change product offerings from door to barriers for example because they're demountable and you can color code the uh, the railings and so on and so forth um, and I, I've got a few points, but I won't touch on all of them. Other ones are, of course, property specific constraints. Uh, of course, the surveyors have uh, got a very keen eye on on identifying quite quickly what, what some of the entry points for water are into properties. However, uh, our contractors are also very perceptive to this. And it's not until you get onto the property to see, oh, actually, these products might not work because ultimately floodwater can enter here so again the contracts we work with have been absolutely brilliant and they 
sort of our eyes and ears on the ground to to see all of this and and that constant engagement between ourselves the homeowners and the contractors to evolve our management on property by property basis overcomes it quite nicely so uh yeah i'll let uh rebecca talk about the the happier side of things yeah leave us on the leave us on the positive yeah. note <laughs> yeah Thanks. um i think the most obvious one and the biggest one is you know enabling residents to empower flood protection for themselves um when a scheme you know large scheme can't protect their property i think so, there were a couple that were literally just on the outskirts of a large scheme that had recently been um constructed it's it's giving them back a bit of protection um and they sign up to it at the end of the day they they all sign up to it so they all want it and they're all very keen i think on some um projects we've even had people like neighbors come up to us and ask us whether they could be involved and um it's 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 giving that power back to them personally for myself working on bigger projects i don't tend to talk to residents that it's going to help at the end of the day um these bigger projects are great to work on but i don't actually see that impact to the locals so it's really nice to be able to talk to the locals and get them you know their input into it all um and also the locals choosing what they want i mean there's some some people that a flood flood boards probably aren't the best approach for them because they're not as mobile so giving them that option of where where they can go with it and installing a flood door instead and things like that and finally I've worked on one with Devon County Council and that's led to another project because they've seen how great it is and how effective it is and it's led to them doing it further down the road with another community. Okay well I think that's probably us about running out of time actually but Becca, Henry and Ricky thank you for that. I think I think it's really interesting and, and important to understand the key differences in terms of delivering the different types of of flood risk management uh, infrastructure and, and flood risk management solutions. So thank you for that. And again, it, it builds in the whole thing about we're doing this for people, communities, and with that comes personalities involved. So thank you for that. Over to you, Fyla. Fantastic. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you uh, to Henry, no, Ricky, Beck, uh, yeah, f thanks for that. Uh, and yes, uh, I think if you if you take nothing away from that, something that tells me really is when it comes down to it, uh, you know, the owner needs to have a voice. If you don't let them have a voice, it will come back to bite you. So this kind of project, very the individualism is really very important. And that's one key thing I, I think I want to take away from it. Uh, what we'll now do is we'll move into uh, our final question and answer session for, for just over 10 minutes or so. Uh, so if uh, uh, the earlier speakers can join us as well, uh, depending on the questions that we get. Uh, I'll probably want to start with some, actually, all a, a few questions to do with funding. Uh, it's one from John Easton uh, in, regarding Karen in Appleby. Did she pay for all the home improvements herself or was she supported or funded? Uh, from Ashley Slater, uh, is there any government or charity grants given for these flood defences and does that vary for residential compared to businesses? So I guess, I guess just a few things around funding, uh, uh, if, if anyone might want to pick those up. Well, I'll jump in and then I'm sure Richard will take over, but I'll jump in for Karen. Karen used the um, Blood Recovery uh, Resilience DEFRA grant. Community Foundation in Cumbria gave her a grant, but also she put in her own contributions as well. So it was sort of mix of funding, really. Yeah, um, uh, so just in terms of the funding that's available, um, so there are a number of funding pots that are available, um, but uh, some of them are time limited and some of them um, you can't opt in. You have to be selected to, um, to, to have your property considered. So 
I'll start off with the, the DEFRA uh, flood repair grant. Um, so that is this £5,000 um, that is available to homes and businesses um, to look at um, implementing uh, flood resilience measures. Um, it's, it's activated following major flooding. Um, so when the Department for Housing, Leveling Up and Communities uh, activate the flood recovery framework that then prompts DEFRA to activate the uh, the flood repair grant. Um, it's administered by lead local flood authorities in England, um, but available across the UK. Um, and um, that gives homeowners the opportunity to look at various different types of um, uh, PFR measures. So not just the resistance measures, not just trying to keep the, the water out but um, also those recoverability measures. So um, reducing the damage if the water does get in. Um, but as I said, that one's only usually available when it's activated after major flooding, um, which it has been a couple of times this winter. There's, uh, there's government granting aid fundings that comes from um, DEFRA and administered either by the Environment Agency or local authorities. So that is where a scheme is identified. So a number of properties have been identified at being uh, at high risk. Um, and then a, a PFR scheme is developed um, and the engagement takes place with homeowners. Um, usually the, the granting aid funding that comes from government won't be enough to fully fund um, the measures that are required. So extra funding is needed from other places. So things like homeowner contributions um, or um, local levy, which is available from regional flood and coastal committees can be used to, to top that up. Um, there's Build Back Better, which is Flood Re's uh, recovery scheme. So that is only available once a property is flooded. So um, that is administered through the, uh, the homeowner's insurance company. Um, and that can be used so that that can offer up to £10,000 of additional funding to use on um, PFR measures. And then I know a number of local authorities around the country operate kind of their own schemes. Um, so offering different amounts of money um, to, to homeowners to opt into. And that money either comes from their own coffers or um, sometimes from local levy funding as well, topped up with, um, with granting aid funding from government. So it's always worth kind of looking around, doing research, um, speaking to a local authority to work out if funding is available. But then as, as Mary alluded to earlier on, there are lots and lots of low cost measures that people can do themselves. So I think, I think the first, you know, the first step I would always suggest would be, you know, an individual gets a survey done of the risks to their home and also what measures might be suitable um, because by doing that you can then come up with that menu of options um, that then they can look into not necessarily to fund straight away but you know if you're having your kitchen redone um, in two years time then okay think about a resilient kitchen if you're doing a bit of you know plastering in your living room then how about you think about um, a different type of you know lime plaster if you're redoing your carpets We'll think about hard flooring. So it, it can almost come up with that, that um, those, those different types of resilient home improvements that you can do over a period of time rather than in, in, one, um, in one bulk lot. Fantastic. F thanks for that. I'll move on to the next. Actually, there are a couple of questions here. And I think uh, Fran and Paul here might be interested in this. Uh, from Eleanor, how can we support tenants? of residential or business properties to encourage landlords to fit PFR measures. And there's another one from Beatrice. We've been discussing PFR in terms of homeowners reducing their own risk, but given the large percentage uh, 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 of, uh, 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 of people are private renters, social renters, 37% uh, in total who do not own their own homes, how do we make sure that the developments in PFR arena don't only benefit the affluent and not exclude or marginalize people and communities already in on deprived or precarious uh, situations. So I thought that really, you know, yeah, yeah, that's all follows on from the kind of things you presented. Uh, so I don't know whether Fran, Paul, any thoughts on those? Um, yeah, I, I can start on that. Um, I, I can't see whether Paul is still on the call. Um, he's not yeah. appearing on my screen, but... Uh... I don't yeah, know. I, I am here, but my there, uh, video, yeah. video has been disabled. Yeah. Ah, right. That's fine. Um, yeah. The um, I think it, it's something we're going through now as part of our F Crip work in Resilient Roach. Um, 
it's quite a lot of of engagement with the uh, with the landlord sector, but also the social housing sector. Rochdale Borough Wide Housing is our main social housing provider in the borough, and we're looking um, at two things with them. One is the um, what we're calling the Resilient Repair Program, which is the um, PFR plus uh, Energy Works, and also how we might get them to support the um, uh, you know an insurance provision scheme as well. Um, I think what's underpinning this is engagement because landlords are a notoriously varied section in terms of their level of responsibility and commitment to the properties. Um, I think as Paul alluded to earlier, um, there's quite a lot in poorer areas where the landlord is uh, using um, is, is looking for a high yield but low investment in the actual quality of the property itself. And I think that's where things other, it's carrot and stick perhaps to some extent as well, because one thing that we, through working with our housing team, can identify where we can start to use um, the, the good landlord scheme, as Paul alluded to, but also where necessary um, enforcement powers through through the Housing Act, um, so that where a property um, could be considered to be at, at higher risk from flooding, um, and therefore, you know, affect its livability, then we can look at whether those powers can be used um, to actually um, encourage that landlord to actually do something or, or at least engage with the authority where the authority can look at all sorts of measures, whether that's equity loans or whether it's linking in to something like our FCRIP programme where the council is putting capital monies uh, into the pot along with the um, the grant funding through the FCRIP program. Um, Paul, I think you did quite a lot of work with landlord engagement, obviously through the um, um, flood poverty project. Is there anything specific you'd want to add? Yeah, so we identified, Fran, um, landlords as being, you know, a really key sector that we need to engage with uh, because for, for a whole manner of, manner of reasons, the, the fact that they own they own the asset, the, they're responsible for the asset. Modifications can't be made to a property without uh, landlord's uh, authorization, um, for, for instance. So landlords we've identified as, as being absolute, absolutely key. Um, a lot of this, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty complicated um, um, area. So as we've discussed, Fran, you know, um, Landlords might but might uh, sign up to a scheme, but it tends to be the better landlords that do so. Mm -hmm. Then there's the question about enforcement. So if landlords aren't fulfilling their responsibilities, then you know again back to that old question about well, local authorities are are, are increasingly cash strapped. There isn't enforcement. Um, social housing agencies don't necessarily have enforcement officers that they can that they can deploy, and if they do deploy them, it tends to not be for flood risk management. Uh, issues or infringements, uh, for for example. So so it's a it's a very complicated, uh, it's incredibly complicated picture. Um, there is um one of the things that we've we've done as a as a project team is to respond to uh the Greater Manchester uh, Landlord Charter, which has just been launched. Um and and to fly the flag for flood risk management. Um, in that, so for instance, in, in trying to make sure that whenever people look around a property, or whenever they take on, uh, whenever they rent a property, that they're that they're informed about flood risk, um, of that of that property, which you know something very simple that just simply hasn't hasn't been happening. So there are small wins that um, or small wins, but could make a could make a big difference. Uh, to individuals, so we're we're constantly kind of looking for these kind of marginal gains that we might be able to find. Uh, for instance, in engagement with with uh, with landlords, I would just say um, as well, it's not just. It, I totally agree that this is a particularly uh, big problem for the rental sector, but we can't also forget that homeowners need support, need guidance, need help as well. There are a lot of people who are asset rich, own their own property, sometimes own them own them outright. But still struggle to engage with the PFR agenda. Still struggle to engage uh, with maintenance. So, uh, you know, we we also we we do also need to be a very very aware of that that there that there is a you know even people that own their properties can be overlooked as well. I, I think the other thing to add to it is just information, which uh, in areas where you've got a high turnover of tenants, 
and it's trying to get the landlords on board to actually ensure that new tenants get the information about the flood resilience products, the level of risk at that premises, that, that, that property, and how they can work together, how they can work with the local authority to find out more about how they can manage the flood risk better. Um, and this is why we want to also bring the street champions in, uh, because if landlords are not necessarily pointing that direction, then we've got somebody, the nosy neighbour effectively, who can who can actually perform that role. Fantastic. Thanks for that. I guess uh, probably take the word out of uh, Mary's mouth. The word uh, a flood plan is probably a key thing in there uh, in the sense that especially when people are moving around, you know, someone comes in, the first thing he needs to know is there is PFR, but also this is the flood plan. This is what you do. This is how you get the message. This is what you do. This is who you call. And I think that, that you know, as we say, it's not about having the product there, but all the things that make sure that at that point when, when it's required, it's actually there and it works. Fantastic. What actually an interesting question here uh from jamie jamie cooper what are the possible pfr approaches or solutions to flooding of terrace buildings or where water comes up through the floor particularly when you have terraced or semi-detached buildings where the other per the other person who owns the other one is not interested and uh, you want to protect your property i assume some of the guys from arcadius would have come across this yes we have exactly that um, it's, um, it's a difficult one. Um, in terms of water coming up through the floor, uh, there's a limited amount you can do. And it's uh, one of the things that we've incorporated in some places is sump pumps to deal with the water rather than uh, you can't stop it, uh, but you can deal with it before it becomes a major problem. Um, in terms of dealing with where you have two properties, two semis, for instance, and one wants it and one doesn't want it, that's where you end up with a bit of a problem because you, you can defend the property around the perimeter, uh, but it depends a lot on what the wall is like between the two properties. And uh, you are very much dictated to by circumstance then. So from a technical perspective, that's a bit of a challenge for the designers and the surveyors on exactly how you deal with it. But the other thing to bear in mind is that some of the um, PFR measures are not necessarily immediately adjacent to the house, but they can be on things like garden walls and things of that nature. I mean, uh, one of the photographs that uh, Mary put up earlier was of someone who built a wall around their house. Um, now that's more akin to a, a, a more traditional flood defense scheme, but you've got people with garden walls. And if you have two people behind that garden wall, um, one of the schemes we had in, Form, uh, in Devon was exactly like this, where we had three a uh, line of four terraces and they had a wall in front of them. And trying to sort that out was not easy, um, but it does come back to talking to all the people involved and engaging with them and finding out what they really wanted. And that process, I think people need to recognize that it does take time. It's not something that you can do quickly and uh, demand a, a, a quick response times, which under a lot of uh, more traditional schemes and projects, you have certain expectations as to how quickly the professionals will respond. When you're dealing with the individual homeowners, uh, you've got to take into account that they work in a different way. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that. And uh, while we're running out of time, uh, I don't want to be accused of not dealing with what is actually the one that's got the highest, uh, 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 you know, uh, votes here. So, uh, Paul, we're going to need you for this, Paul Schaffer. Uh, Someone is, uh, Louisa is asking if it's possible for Siwem to lobby national policy to fit cheaper non-heritage uh, flood doors, PFR on listed buildings and conservation. In essence, you know, Siwem, you should be lobbying to disregard the requirements of, uh, of listed buildings and others. So I'll, I'll leave Paul to answer whether that's something Siwem might want to lobby for. 
I, I think it'd be fair to say, Fela, that it might not be of all the things that we need to probably lobby on or around popular flood resilience, that might not be the first thing that we would approach. Uh, I, I think this needs to be done with the conservation officer in terms of thinking about what the right approach is for the housing. And I know I always get that it was not it was English heritage, is it historic England now? Uh, I know there. I know that they're very keen to produce some further guidance on how to improve uh, flood resilience. And I think there's some guidance coming out from them in the next couple of months. So I don't I think I don't think lobbying that type of thing is something that Simon would do. But we're very keen to be advocating uh, good practice at PFR generally and are working with DEFRA and DLUC with regards to what can be done around uh, planning and also uh, building regulations. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. Uh, on that note, I will keep you still there, Paul, and thank uh, our speakers and uh, the questions really been very engaging and move us uh, very quickly on to uh, Paul's uh, introduction of the Be Flood Ready there you go, Paul. Yeah, great. Great, thank you, Fela. So, yeah, I'm going to spend the last five, ten minutes or so just talking us through what Siren's doing with regards to this community of practice. So we, we're, in the next few uh, months, in middle of May, we're going to be launching the Be Flood Ready Siren's Community of Practice website. So this this event was the first start in that process. And as you know, the, the, the need for improved uh, resilience is growing. Uh, but what we're seeing with regards to the industry is that whilst flood resilience is growing, it's there's still, sorry, whilst the need for flood resilience is growing, it, the industry itself is still quite fragmented and evolving. And what we really need to do is start consolidating on some of the activities that have gone on in the past and what's required for the future. And what we're really keen to do is provide a sense of community around those that are interested and involved in delivering property flood resilience, improve the competency of those people delivering uh, some of the approaches, whether it be uh, those assessing flood risk, those, develop, uh, those undertaking surveys or those delivering the PFR measures uh, and delivering the recoverability, we want to make sure that the competency is high enough so that the public and risk management authorities and insurers have increased confidence in them and that there's consistency in terms of delivery. So we're really keen to do, as an, as an institution, do what we can to support professionals and also support the public and thereby uh, support the sector in delivering uh, good practice. So, as we know, there's a number of initiatives underway, including the Syria Code of Practice for PFR. SIREM and partners are developing the training, and for the future, we're also going to be developing a specialist register for certified PFR registers, primarily looking at those undertaking the survey role, but also thinking about uh, those undertaking or delivering the measures, so the contractors. Uh, there's the PFR roundtable that's been going on for three or four years. Uh, and there's also initiatives coming out from insurers and flood rate, particularly around Build Back Better. And there's obviously, I think there was a response to one of the questions uh, in there around the uh, develop the environment agency's got a PFR framework, which is open to risk management authorities uh, in England and also available in the devolved other devolved countries about taking up forward. So the idea behind this Be Flood Ready community of practice is really to put our arms around this and more, because we've also been, uh, Richard's also been talking about some of the Pathfinder projects. So the idea is to provide an opportunity to consolidate for all that information. So, so what we're going to do within uh, this website is site, host and signpost relevant resources related to PFR. So at the moment, we've got 120 or so identified resources that will be, a, that's available at the moment, linking to different elements of property flood resilience. And the idea is that there will be a searchable and 
uh, database and also that could be filtered in terms of uh, specific elements of the information. We're also really key, uh, keen to host events on delivering good practice. Uh, this is one of them. We've got one that we're planning for later in the year, poss possibly early autumn, to talk about the work that's going through the Environment Agency's innovation projects. And we're also uh, going to promote uh, activities uh, around training and other events that are, are freely available as well. And we're really keen to start sharing industry news, whether it be through blogs from uh, our partners and supporters or blog other blogs from other sources, and also start developing a newsletter, which will probably go out quarterly to update people on good practice, policy changes, or anything else that might be relevant to, uh, to those interested in property flood resilience. And we're also quite keen to, uh, once we've started getting uh, uh, people through our training and also through the certification process, is to host a register of those PFR professionals that are certified. So the outputs, and I've gone through this, is primarily going to be a website which is going to have some basic information available around property flood resilience, blogs, events, which will be similar to this, and we also might have a few face-to-face -face events. We're also really keen to be able to provide searchable case studies so people will be able to look for different elements of property flood resilience, whether it be around resistant measures, recoverability processes, or things that people do in a preparation, we really want to start providing case studies. And we're probably going to start with about 10 case studies going forward. So there'll be opportunities for people to feed into that as things progress. And we're hoping that the Be Flood Ready website will appeal to a wide range of different professionals uh, and organisations, ranging from flood risk professionals through to those people working in insurance and loss adjusters, construction professionals, and also uh, those involved focus primarily on PFR in terms of contractors and suppliers. And we also want to make sure that we've got material and resources that are relevant to uh, the public. So I'm hoping you've got your uh, mobile phone ready for a QR code coming up. But really, without, the, without these partners and supporters, we can't do any of this. So I really want to say a special thank you. And as you can see, they... They represent different organisations within the sector. We've got insurers, we've got devolved governments, we've got regulators, and we've also got a number of uh, suppliers and consultants that are involved in different elements of the EA's PFR framework. But also we have other providers that are, are out there uh, offering services to those people that have been flooded, whether it be local authorities or whether it be individuals. So if you, look, if you can scan that, you will find an opportunity to register for further information on the Be Flood Ready uh, initiative that will enable you to get access and be added to our newsletters. We really would welcome any contributions in terms of case studies, and we can circulate a template to those interesting case studies. And we'd be really welcome to hear news items, have blogs, have any other content to signpost, and also, we'd be really welcome. Uh, we'd really welcome any other suggestions for topics. So please do use my email address there to contact me on this. One thing we're really keen to do is to maintain the integrity of the Be Flood Ready uh, uh, approach. Is to, that we can't promote individual products or services, but we can promote a generic philosophy. So, if you have any questions or queries or want to get involved in the Be Flood Ready. Uh, community practice, please do reach out to us and we can see what we can do. And likewise, if you have any queries about the training and the certification, please do use that email address. So without any further ado, I'll pass you over to Fola so we can leave before five o'clock. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, no pressure. I'm the one standing between you and five o'clock and doing what you need to do. Well, I mean, I've had a great, great, great uh, afternoon. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic, starting from Mary 
you know, reminding us that PFR is not just about stopping water, but really adapting your property, your content, so that they're less vulnerable to flood water as well. Uh, Juliet and uh, Richard, you know, making us aware of the Environment Agency Framework, letting us know it's also available to other risk management authorities. Uh, importance of understanding people's perception and their role, their keenness really to, to mainstream PFR. Uh, Fran and Paul really uh, letting us know that it's important to understand the context of the owners, uh, you know, very, really important. And, and, and even in some cases, some support may be needed and we shouldn't assume that everyone uh, can just look after this thing because there's no point putting something there unless it can be managed for the whole life and, and maintained properly. And then we had uh, Ricky, Henry, and Rebecca, uh, you know, really just, you know, making us understand, uh, 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 putting across the importance of a survey, actually understanding what needs to be done in the first place, working together with the designers, the contractors, and the house occupiers to get something that works well and, and, and can be managed you know, into the long term. So really, I think what it tells us is this is not just about putting in blocks you know, blocking holes and apertures, but it really is about the whole, the whole of the building, all the other parts. You know, the 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 uh, the pointing, the holes, everything, and about managing it for the whole life. And uh, hopefully, like me, you've picked up uh, some real great things today that you'll be able to take forward. And perhaps the final thanks, actually, uh, is to Gareth Boyd. I mean, Gareth has done a fantastic work of answering giving really good, great answers to a lot of questions or, 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 you know, in the Q&A. So thanks very much for that. You definitely have been very busy. Uh, so I guess one or two final things before we go. Now, I'm not sure about this. For the, the Q&As that we were unable, we've obviously answered the ones that, are, that, that most people were interested in. But if there are any other ones, is that it? Or is there any other plans? Paul? Uh, there's, I, I haven't yet asked whether the uh, panellists are able to help, but I, I will I'll explore that and see if we can. And if not, there, there's, so there is a forum on LinkedIn, actually, thinking about it, that might be the best way to use it. That's exactly what it's there for. So I think in the chat, you will find there's a link to LinkedIn for the Be Flood Ready Forum. So if you have any questions that are remaining, please do put those, put those there. Fantastic. So thanks, Paul. I put you on the spot there, but you were great, you know, great to answer as usual. Okay, so really all that's left for me to do is to thank the speakers for their presentations and the participants. I mean, at some point I saw a very, very big number and, and it has been really, you know, well participated. Uh, thanks, audience, for your questions. Uh, and, and really, uh, I would like to thank the partners again and the supporters of Be Flood Ready for making this possible. So thank you very much, everyone, and good afternoon.